Tim Killeen. I am a member of the statistics faculty at the University of Connecticut and have been a colleague of Gottfried Noether for 13 years. It is my pleasure to introduce him to you today. Professor Noether did his graduate work at Columbia University during the late 1940s. There he first developed an interest in a new area of research known as nonparametric statistics. At Columbia, under the tutelage of such notable statisticians as Wolfowitz and Pittman, his initial interest developed into a most productive lifetime of research and teaching. Godfrey received his PhD from Columbia in 1949 and spent the next two years at New York University. Since then, he has made his home in New England, first on the faculty of Boston University, and since 1968 as professor and head of the statistics department at the University of Connecticut. In addition, he has held Fulbright lectureships in Austria and Germany and visiting faculty positions at Berkeley, Harvard, and MIT. He is a fellow of the American Statistical Association and the Institute of Mathematical Statistics. He has been elected to membership in the International Statistical Institute. Dr. Noether's research has spanned the spectrum of nonparametric statistics. However, he is best known for his work on efficiency of tests, for the development of some major ideas concerning confidence intervals in the nonparametric setting, and as a leader in popularizing nonparametric methods as viable alternatives to normal theory approaches. For the last decade, he has been deeply involved in improving methods of teaching statistics. Godfrey is currently a member of several national and international committees which are studying this issue. One of his books, Introduction to Statistics, a Nonparametric Approach, successfully presents the bold thesis that a beginning statistics course can be presented in a conceptually intuitive fashion without lists of formulae for means, standard deviations, and sums of squares. Even though the first edition of this book appeared more than 10 years ago, the valuable insights that may be found there have gone relatively unnoticed by other authors. He is currently working on a second major revision of this text. Gottfried's early papers are landmarks in the discipline. His 1949 confidence interval article in JASA and the 1955 Annals paper on the theorem of Pittman are must reading for any serious student of nonparametric statistics. However, my favorite article is a little three-page work of his that appeared in the 1970 Annals. It presents a central limit theorem for certain sums of dependent random variables. The surprisingly useful and very clever treatment appeals to the method of moments to obtain its results and stands on its own without a single reference. It is a real gem, but does not seem to be very widely known. If you get the chance, look it up. I think that you'll find it very rewarding. It is my pleasure now to present Professor Gottfried Noether speaking on Nonparametrics, the early years, impressions and recollections. Dr. Noether. Thank you, Dr. Killeen. Nonparametrics is nearly as old as statistics itself. The bibliography of nonparametric statistics by I. R. Savage contains an entry which goes back to 1710. In that year, John Arbuthnot, scholar, scientist, mathematician, literary figure, and physician to Queen Anne, published a paper in the Philosophical Transactions entitled An Argument for Divine Providence Taken from the Constant Regularity Observed from Birth of Both Sexes. In the paper, Arbuthnot performed what surely must have been the first sign test and quite likely the first test ever of a statistical hypothesis. From records of christenings of infants in the city of London, Arbuthnot had noted that for each of the 82 years from 1629 to 1710, the number of males exceeded the number of females. On the basis of these observations, he rejected what he called the hypothesis of chance, which assigned probability one half to an excess of male over female birth in any one year. Rather, Arbuthnot concluded, divine providence ordained an excess of male births over female births to offset a higher male death rate 
and thus ensure equal proportions of adult males and females. The idea of an omnipresent activating deity who maintains mean statistical values formed the foundations of much of the statistics of the 18th century. We shall see that there are additional isolated instances of the use of non-parametric methods during the closing years of the 19th century and the early years of the 20th century, but many present-day writers on non-parametrics consider the Hotelling and Pops paper on rank correlation in the 1936 Annals of Mathematical Statistics as a real start of the discipline which is now generally known as non-parametric statistics. There are even some statisticians who would postpone the start of non-parametrics until 1945, the year when Wilcoxon published his first paper dealing with what are now called the Wilcoxon 1 and 2 sample test. The actual word non-parametric appears for the first time in a 1942 paper by J. Wolfowitz. In the paper, which is a report of his PhD research, Wolfowitz looks at developments in mathematical statistics and observes. Most of these developments have this feature in common, that the distribution functions of the various stochastic variables which enter into their problems are assumed to be of known functional form and the theories of estimation and of testing hypotheses are theories of estimation of and of testing hypotheses about one or more parameters finite in number the knowledge of which would completely determine the various distribution functions involved. We shall refer to the situation for brevity as a parametric case and denote the opposite situation where the functional forms of the distributions are unknown as a non-parametric case. Wolfowitz then goes on to explain. The literature of theoretical statistics deals principally with a parametric case. The reasons for this are perhaps partly historic and partly the fact that interesting results could more readily be expected to follow from the assumption of normality. Another reason is that while the parametric case was for long developed on an intuitive basis, progress in the non-parametric case requires the use of modern notions. However, the needs of theoretical completeness and of practical research require the development of the theory of the non-parametric case. It seems clear from this quotation that Wolfowitz's main reason for adding the term non-parametric to the statistical vocabulary was to call attention to the need for research in a new field. Indeed, the second part of Wolfowitz's paper constitutes an attempt to apply the likelihood ratio principle which Neyman and Pearson had proposed 10 years earlier for the solution of, non of parametric problems to the non-parametric case. In retrospect, the attempt was not very successful. Seven years later, while reviewing non-parametric inference at the first Berkeley Symposium, Wolfowitz observed that a small beginning had been made, but that no general theory of non-parametric tests existed as of that date. General acceptance of the term non-parametric was rather slow. During the 1940s, only a few mathematical statisticians at Columbia and Princeton universities used it in papers which they published almost exclusively in the Annals of Mathematical Statistics. The first mention of the word non-parametric in the Journal of the American Statistical Association does not seem to have occurred until the year 1949 in the paper Confidence Limits in the Non-Parametric Case, which at the suggestion of Jack Wolfowitz, I had written as a graduate student at Columbia University. Soon after Wolfowitz had called attention to non-parametrics, 
Henry Sheffe responded with a paper, Statistical Inference in the Nonparametric Case. This paper not only proposed a theoretical framework for the development of nonparametric theory, it also provided a fairly complete list of then existing procedures which could be called nonparametric. It, it is interesting to look at the status of nonparametrics in 1943. We find hypothesis testing discussed under five headings goodness of fit, randomness, the problem of two samples, independence, and the analysis of variance. Under goodness of fit, we have Carl Pearson's chi-square criterion, which goes back all the way to 1900, and the Kolmogorov statistic of the early 1930s. The principal tool for testing randomness in a series of observations are runs of various kinds. Among the two sample tests mentioned by Sheffe, in addition to Pearson's chi-square, are Pittman's randomization test based on the statistic y bar minus x bar, the Walt Wolfowitz run test, and the Smirnov test. For testing independence of two variables, we find the Spearman rank correlation test and Pittman's randomization test based on the Pearson correlation coefficient. Kendall's tau is mentioned, but dismissed with the remark that it does not seem to offer any practical advantages of a Spearman row. Under the analysis of variance label, Sheffe mentions only the analysis of randomized blocks. In addition to Fisher's sign test for the comparison of two treatments, we find Pittman's randomization test and Friedman's rank analysis test. Sheffe's discussion of nonparametric estimation is considerably shorter than the discussion of hypothesis testing. Before getting down to details, Sheffe finds it necessary to define what he means by estimation in the nonparametric case. I may be reading too much into Sheffe's words, but I sense some uneasiness on his part in using the term nonparametric in connection with estimation. This is how he leads up to estimation. Let theta be a real number determined by a distribution f. That is, let theta be a functional of f. Thus, theta might be the mean of the distribution, in which case theta would be defined for all distributions possessing a first moment. We shall not call theta a parameter in order to avoid confusion with a parametric case. Sheffe clearly recognized the potential problem with the term nonparametric. I shall have more to say about this problem later on. By 1943, the subject of point estimation had received practically no attention from the nonparametric viewpoint. Sheffe simply mentions that the ideas of unbiasedness and consistency of point estimates carry over from the parametric to the nonparametric case without change. He adds, that under very general conditions, the sample median is a consistent estimate of the population median. Confidence intervals had fared only slightly better than point estimation. Sheffe mentions just three problems. Confidence intervals for the median of a population, confidence intervals for the difference of two medians, and confidence limits for an unknown distribution function. The confidence interval for a population median bounded by two order statistics was introduced by W. R. Thompson in a 1936 Annals paper. For the difference of two medians, Sheffe proposed an interval based on separate confidence intervals for the two medians, but he adds that the procedure is not very efficient. Alternatively, 
in the case of the shift parameter of the shift model, Pittman's randomization test for the two sample problem furnishes a confidence interval for the median difference. It took another 10 years until Lincoln Moses proposed the intuitively simplest of all possible intervals, one that is bounded by two appropriately chosen sample differences y minus x. The problem of confidence limits for a cumulative distribution function was formulated and solved by Wald and Wolfowitz in 1939. It is not generally realized that Wald and Wolfowitz considered much more general confidence regions than the confidence band that results from inverting the Kolmogorov goodness of fit criterion. But the need to invert an n plus one dimensional matrix to calculate confidence coefficients hindered the practical exploitation of these general results. When Wald and Wolfowitz wrote their paper in 1939, they were not aware of the 1933 paper by Kolmogorov, which gave the asymptotic distribution of the Kolmogorov statistic. On the other hand, there is no evidence that Kolmogorov had recognized the possibility of inverting his goodness of fit statement to produce a confidence band prior to the Wald Wolfowitz paper. The problem of non-parametric estimation which obtained the greatest attention during the early 1940s was the problem of distribution-free tolerance intervals. The underlying problem had been posed by Walter A. Schuhard, an engineer at Bell Telephone Laboratories. For the one-dimensional case, the problem was solved by Wilkes with the help of order statistics. An utterly simple but ingenious idea by Wald made it possible to use the Wilkes approach also with multivariate data. It is rather interesting to note that most present-day writers on nonparametrics do not even mention tolerance intervals. Chaffee's judgment in 1943 concerning the future of nonparametrics was prophetic. This is what he had to say then. Only a very small fraction of the literature of mathematical statistics is devoted to the nonparametric case, and most of this is of the last decade. We may expect this branch to be rapidly explored, however, the prospect of a theory freed from specific assumptions about the form of the population distribution should excite both the theoretician and the practitioner, since such a theory might combine elegance of structure with wide applicability. The bibliography attached to Chaffee's survey paper mentions some 60 titles. We can gain an idea of the rapid growth of nonparametrics during subsequent years by looking at the bibliography of I.R. Savage, which I mentioned earlier. The first edition of this bibliography, published 10 years after the Chaffee survey, has 999 entries. A second edition, published nine years after the first edition, contains about 3,000 titles. No further editions of this useful bibliography were published, and I, and I am unaware of any other reasonably complete literature counts. My personal initiation into nonparametrics occurred in the fall of 1946 when J. Wolfowitz offered at Columbia University what must have been one of the first, if not the first, course ever in nonparametric statistics. Two years later, I had the additional good fortune of being present at the, as a, at the guest lectures which E.J.J. Pittman presented at Columbia University. 
My lifelong interest in non-parametrics clearly started with the Wolfowitz and Pittman lectures. Let me look at these two sets of lectures in some detail. On the whole, Wolfowitz covered material mentioned in the Sheffet survey, supplementing it with new results which he and Wald had obtained in the meantime. One particular such result stands out in my mind. Condition W for the asymptotic normality of linear forms under randomization. Asymptotic normality of relevant test statistics under the null hypothesis had been taken for granted all along. But early arguments had usually relied merely on the study of the first four moments of the test statistic. Now, by checking that the coefficients of the linear form and the observations over which randomization occurred satisfied a simple condition, it became possible to establish rigorously that the distribution of the test statistic tended to normality with increasing sample size. The spearman rank correlation coefficient offered a striking example of the power of the theorem. Hotelling and Pabst had provided the lengthy proof of the asymptotic normality of spearman row but with the wald wolfowitz theorem, it was only necessary to show that the integers from 1 to n satisfied condition W, an almost obvious fact. Several years later, I had another demonstration of the power of the wald wolfowitz theorem. The eminent Dutch algebraist B. van der Waarden had proposed a two-sample test which used percentiles of the normal distribution as weights. But van der Waarden did not succeed in providing a generally valid proof of the asymptotic normality of his test statistic. As I was able to point out to him, all that was really necessary was to show that the percentiles of the normal distribution satisfied condition W, a result which followed immediately from the fact that the normal distribution has finite moments of all orders. In my PhD dissertation, I was able to further weaken condition W. This weaker condition after further simplification now plays an important role in the theory of linear rank statistics. While Wolfowitz provided a broad survey of what was known in 1946 about nonparametrics, Pittman's lectures in 1948 were more narrowly focused how to compare non-parametric methods with corresponding normal theory methods and among themselves. Most statisticians of that time took it for granted that non-parametric methods were what they liked to call wasteful of information. As we shall see later, even Wilcoxon, who in 1945 proposed what has become the most widely used non-parametric procedure in existence, was quite convinced that his method did not utilize all the information available to him. But he was willing to make a sacrifice for the sake of simplicity. Wolfowitz's response to criticism implying wastefulness of non-parametric methods was straightforward and to the point. The only kind of information a non-parametric procedure is likely to waste is information which is unavailable anyway. In his Columbia University lectures, Pittman went a step further by proposing a quantitative measure for the comparison of two competing tests of the same hypothesis based on the comparison of respective sample sizes that produce equal power for equal alternatives. This quantity is now known as Pittman relative efficiency. For the comparison of the sign test with a t-test, the Pittman relative efficiency turned out to be a disappointingly low 2 divided by pi or 0.64 if 
observations came from a normal population. A statistician who under such circumstances uses a sign test in place of the t-test indeed wastes one observation out of every three. But this is not the complete picture, as Pittman pointed out, as far back as 1948. Since statisticians use a t-test not only when sampling normal populations, supplementary information is needed. For populations with sufficiently long tails, the sign test may well require fewer observations than the t-test to achieve a prescribed power. For example, for double exponential distributions, the Pittman efficiency of the sign test relative to the t-test is 2 so that a statistician who uses a t-test rather than the sign test actually wastes one out of every two observations. For the one and two sample Wilcoxon tests compared to the corresponding t-tests, the Pittman efficiency turned out to be an amazingly high 3 divided by pi or 0.955 in the case of norm normal populations. Even more surprisingly, whatever the underlying distribution, the efficiency of the Wilcoxon tests relative to the t-tests is never less than 0.864 and is actually greater than 1 for populations with only slightly longer tails than those for normal distributions. Far from being wasteful of information, for many practical sampling situations, the Wilcoxon tests make better use of the available information than the corresponding t-tests. In addition to providing exact tests when the null hypothesis is true and being considerably less sensitive to outliers among the observations than the t-procedures. Pittman's concept of relative efficiency was just the tool which I had needed in my thesis work on the effect of transformations on the observations in the Wald Wolfowitz test of randomness. Due to circumstances, Pittman never published his work on relative efficiency beyond the write up in a restricted and highly prized set of lecture notes. As a result, the annals paper which came out of my thesis remained for several years the only generally available reference to Pittman efficiency. In 1955, I published an extension of Pittman's results and called attention to the close connection between Pittman test efficiency and classical estima estimation efficiency. As early as 1936, Hotelling and Pabst, in dealing with the Spearman rank correlation coefficient, had used estim estimating efficiency as a measure of testing efficiency. And one year later, Cochrane used the same approach for comparing the sign test with a t-test. But none of these statisticians ever elaborated on what they meant by testing efficiency nor did they go beyond normal populations for their comparisons. It was Pittman's approach that permitted the first realistic evaluation of non-parametric tests of hypotheses. Fifteen years later, in 1963, Lehman completed the picture by showing that Pittman efficiency also provided the information required for the comparison of competing confidence interval procedures. Thus, starting with the late 1930s, a relatively small group of theoretical statisticians were seriously interested in establishing firm foundations for a new branch of statistics which became known as non-parametric statistics. Quite unrelated to these efforts, and in some cases preceding these efforts by many years, we find attempts by applied scientists in various fields of research to get away from the restraints of the normal distribution. For some of these researchers, 
It was a conscious realization that methods based on the normality assumption might lead to misleading conclusions or might otherwise be inappropriate. For others, it was simply a desire to reduce computational drudgery. Galton's preference for the median in the 1880s and Spearman's introduction of the rank correlation coefficient in 1904 are early examples of such tendencies. To a great many statisticians, the most typically non-parametric procedure is a two-sample Wilcoxon test. Many years ago, Cuthbert Daniel told me that Wilcoxon had simply been fed up with the drudgery of computing one t-statistic after another and was looking for something simpler when he proposed what is now known as a Wilcoxon two-sample test. He did not think in terms of greater generality, but rather in terms of greater computational ease. He was even willing to play, pay a penalty for this greater simplicity, as becomes quite clear from the following statement. It is not always realized that there are available rapid approximate methods which are quite useful in interpreting the results of experiments, even though these approximate methods do not utilize fully the information contained in the data. To the best of my knowledge, Wilcoxon himself did not adopt the term non-parametric for what he essentially considered to be rapid approximate statistical procedures until many years later. But for many others, the term non-parametric became synonymous with shortcut methods, rough and ready methods, and quick and dirty methods. It is true that when John Tukey and Alan Wallace spoke of rough and ready and quick and dirty methods, they did not intend to express a derogatory judgment. Alan Wallace put it this way, quick and dirty or rough and ready tests are typified by the sign test. It is certainly quick and ready, and it is rough and dirty in that for a publication people usually prefer something more elaborate, though I am sure that this is often superfluous. But in the minds of many practicing statisticians, the rough and ready and quick and dirty labels began to reflect reality, and throughout the 1950s and 60s, non-parametric methods were primarily thought of as ersatz and make do. It is unfortunate that the principal book-length treatments of non-parametric methods of that period, Siegel's Non-Parametric Statistics for the Behavioral Sciences, and Ward's monumental three-volume work, Handbook of Non-Parametric Statistics, we are quite ineffective in dispelling the general, this general impression. Only during the past 10 or 15 years has there been some evidence of a gradual change in attitude. So even now, there are quite a number of statisticians who seem to think that non-parametric methods are inferior and do not deserve to be put on a par with normal theory methods. One of the most attractive features of non-parametrics is a conceptual simplicity of, the, of many of the basic methods. So it is not really surprising that some of the basic ideas occurred to researchers long before they became known under their present names. In a 1957 article in the Journal of the American Statistical Association, Kruskal points out that the scoring scheme on which the candle rank correlation coefficient is based was used as early as 1897 by the German psychologist Fechner. Another German psychologist, psychologist and pedagogue, Gustav Deuchler, proposed the Mann Whitney version of the Wilcoxon two sample test in 1914. And some time ago, to my great surprise, I discovered 
that the German agronomist Walter Ulrich Behrens was an early supporter of the non-parametric approach. It is rather ironic that in the statistical literature, Behrens' name should be inseparably associated with the Behrens-Fischer problem. While commenting on Professor Neyman's Pfizer Colloquium lecture four years ago, I pointed out that Behrens himself did not seem to have put much faith in the solution which he proposed in 1929 for what is now called the Behrens-Fischer problem, and which became the basis of the celebrated neyman fischer controversy. Behrens certainly did not have similar doubts about the desirability of developing what we now call non-parametric methods. He must have been one of the first scientists who realized clearly the limitations of standard normal theory procedures. This is what he had to say in 1933. The arithmetic mean and the standard deviation have gained the widest acceptance for characterizing a set of observations. The leading position of these two statistical measures is presumably connected with the fact that many observation systems follow nearly normal distributions. If the normal error function is appropriate, the arithmetic mean is the most advantageous measure of centrality and the standard deviation is the most advantageous measure of accuracy. But there are situations in which the distribution law has no similarity to, Gaussian, to the Gaussian law of error, and it is therefore important to have methods of data analysis which make no specific assumption about the distribution law. Then, the only usable measure of centrality is the median. Turning to the two-sample problem, Behrens continues. In order to ascertain whether two sets of observations come from the same population, for normal error laws, we find the difference of arithmetic means and the standard deviation of the difference. But if we are dealing with populations of unknown distribution laws, we cannot use statistical measures that depend on the actual size of the objects, but should use measures that essentially depend on the relative position of the objects. Rarely do we find statements as unequivocal as these, even in the present-day non-parametric literature. What then did Behrens propose to put in place of the customary t-test? For the one-sample problem, he, pro he proposed a statistic lambda, which was equal to the number of steps between the sample median and the hypothetical population median, where a step was defined as a passage from one observation to a neighboring observation. Thus, the statistic lambda is simply a linear function of what we now call the scientist statistic. Behrens was primarily interested in hypothesis testing, so that the remark, the measure lambda, indicates bounds within which the true population median presumably lies, almost escapes notice. Can there be much doubt that Behrens proposed a confidence interval for the population median, whose endpoints are two symmetrically positioned order statistics, to use present-day terminology. To fully appreciate this result, we have to remember that Neyman's first paper on confidence intervals did not appear until 1934, and that the generally accepted reference to confidence intervals for a population median is the earlier mentioned 1936 Annals paper by Thompson. Behrens also proposed a solution for the two-sample problem. Generalizing his one-sample statistic, he defined a two-sample statistic based on the number of steps between the two-sample medians. This statistic is a simple linear function of the number of observations in one of the samples that exceed the common median, 
experience thus anticipated by some 15 years what we now call the median test. Let me conclude these reflections on non-parametrics with some final comments. Earlier in the paper I suggested that already in 1943 Chaffee seemed to have felt some uneasy, some, some, has felt some uneasiness about the newly introduced term non-parametric. Five years later, Pittman in his Columbia University lectures was considerably more outspoken about his misgivings concerning the term. In his introductory lecture, he spoke about inference problems encountered in practice. Often, we have no knowledge of the nature of the population distribution except what is supplied by the sample. Well, the tests have been devised to deal with such cases because in developing them and applying them, we usually do not start from an assumption that the chance variable has a distribution function of known form but involving certain unknown parameters they have been called non-parametric tests, but the name is not a good one, and it is to be hoped that someone will soon think of a much better name. We can use these tests to estimate parameters and so test hypotheses concerning parameters. We now know that Pittman's hope has remained unfulfilled. In 1967, I raised the issue of more appropriate terminology in a letter to the editor of the American Statistician. There was some reader support for the idea of change, but no really viable alternatives were proposed. Several readers suggested the term distribution free, but in my opinion, distribution free does not fill the bill. Non-parametric confidence intervals are distribution-free, provided underlying populations are continuous. Non-parametric tests are distribution-free, but only under the null hypothesis and again if the underlying populations are continuous. But non-parametric point estimates are not distribution-free. The term distribution-free has its legitimate place in the statistical vocabulary but it is not sufficiently broad to cover what is now loosely called non-parametrics. Since it is not very likely that one of these days somebody is going to come up with more suitable terminology, I should like to propose a different solution. Is it really necessary to have a separate name for what we now generally call non-parametrics? The term non-parametric may have some historical significance and meaning for theoretical statisticians, but it only serves to confuse applied statisticians. After the quite general mistrust of anything non-parametric during the 1950s and 60s, there are now indications that a growing number of statisticians is willing to accept non-parametric procedures as legitimate alternatives to the classical normal theory methods. Almost every recent introductory statistics text contains a chapter on non-parametric methods. Unfortunately, the treatment remains frequently rather one-sided and superficial. The main emphasis is on a few well-known non-parametric tests of hypotheses, thus strengthening the widely held misconception that non-parametrics is primarily concerned with hypothesis testing. The fact that location, scale, and regression parameters can be estimated non-parametrically by both point estimates and confidence intervals is hardly ever mentioned. In addition, very often the chapter on non-parametrics is placed at the very end of the book and there's almost no attempt to integrate the material on non-parametrics with the corresponding normal theory material. Dropping the term non-parametric altogether from the statistical vocabulary 
would make it much easier to treat statistical method as a unit rather than erecting an artificial barrier between classical methods and something called non-parametric methods, whatever that might be. I have mentioned that my interest in non-parametrics goes back to my graduate days at Columbia University. But over the years, the direction of my interest has gradually changed from the theoretical to the pedagogical. I'm convinced that non-parametric methods form a much more appropriate basis on which to develop an introductory statistics course than the classical normal theory methods. Both conceptually and theoretically, the non-parametric approach is far simpler than the classical approach. In this day and age, when numeracy is as important as literacy, when more and more people are faced with the necessity of coping with quantitative information, it is important to develop statistics courses in which mathematical aspects do not overwhelm the statistical content of the course. The fact that over the years, scientists like Arbuthnot, Fechner, Deuchler, Spearman, Behrens, Wilcoxon and others, whose primary interest was in some field of science rather than in mathematics or statistics, discovered and rediscovered certain basic non-parametric approaches, attests to the conceptual simplicity and spontaneity of these approaches. The same can hardly be said of the compu competing normal theory methods, which pre presuppose a sound background of probability theory for their justification. Why is it then that the ultimate achievement of an introductory statistics course is so often perceived to be the discussion of the one and two sample t-tests? How often have I been asked after outlining my non-parametric version of the introductory statistics course, but where is the t-test? How can you let a student go into the wide world without ever having encountered a single t-statistic? Perhaps, if we stop dividing statistics into parametrics and non-parametrics, this kind of prejudice is going to disappear. Statistics will be the better for it.